And um, a man has been used by the Lord in a mighty way, I believe, to rally up the remnant and to kick them out the nest and say, let's go change things. Amen. Andrew for Nikak, welcome, sir. Thank you, Mark. Wow. Norton, thank you, guys. These are the warriors that have been flowing with what the Holy Spirit has been doing. Thank you for your patience with us. Um, we are so glad. Thank you, Norton, Mark. Um, so, yeah, I was still at the office trying to get away there. We had some PhD presentations, and it was like I was just trying to tell them, listen, I need to be <laughs> in Durban tonight. So, uh, John on the way from Siena Colso. So we're literally on mission, um, God's mission in this country, and it's a privilege. So uh, thank you for welcoming us and having us with you. Uh, we are honestly just amazed. Can I stand here or put the garb worst on? Uh, please, I love to just be closer to the people. Um, honestly, we are so amazed to see. Um, okay, I think it's fine now to see what God is doing across the country. Um, you know, John and I have the privilege of literally going from town to town. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same thing. God is drawing his people forward like we've never seen before. Um, same heart, same mind. It's like a unity of spirit that we've, we've seldom seen and we are so excited. I just want to ask um, the flyers, um, I want to ask whoever has the flyers, please hand them out. I would love for everybody to just have something in their hand. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, so can I just pray for us before we go further? Thank you. Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Lord, with, that we can be a people coming together in your presence. Father, we thank you that you have a plan for this nation, that this nation is on your heart. Even this continent is on your heart, Lord. And Father, as we come here before you and we share your heart, Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will reveal your plans for South Africa, your plans in a time of crisis, Lord, that, that we will know when we walk out here tonight that, yeah, you, there's a destiny unfolding and we are sitting right in the middle of this. Thank you, Lord, that your purpose will prevail. The enemy's plans will not prevail. But your plans, your purpose, and your will will always prevail, and we give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, um, when, uh, when we were traveling, John and I, um, we were just discussing this, and it's amazing, um, you know, just how when God is stirring something, it's almost like uh, Gamaliel the principle. He said, um, if, if this is of God, nothing will stop it. Um, nothing will put it, will quench it. Um, you know, and this is exactly what's been happening. You know, um, a move of God's spirit, and it's, it's humanly unexplainable. And we said that, listen, if we trust God for a miracle in South Africa, um, the, 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 the possibility of change must be impossible. The requirement for a miracle is impossibility. Who knows that? Amen? Otherwise, it's not a miracle. South Africa needs a miracle. We need a divine intervention like this nation has never seen before. And we know there's only one answer. And that answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Where the church has often struggled is understanding how we take that reality of Jesus being the Savior, the one who turns South Africa around, and turn it into a practical sense. To say, listen, how will this actually happen? Because it's wonderful to preach about Jesus. It's wonderful to share, um, you know, about um, God's heart for the nation. But it's another thing to say, God, we want to see you in our communities. We want to see Jesus stopping hunger. We want to see Jesus stopping uh, corruption. We want to see Jesus raising the standard of governance in our nation. So those are the things people are desperate for. So the beauty of this situation is the desperation levels are so high that God's people are saying, Lord, um, we are no longer available to do nothing. 
we are stepping up to the plate. And the hour of the, uh, where we are at this late hour in the country, the desperation for change, is bringing God's people united, unity. And that's also what John and I have been talking about. We haven't seen this kind of united awareness among leaders. Maybe in 94, there was something of this, um, you know, of everybody concerned of a civil war. But now it's almost different. Somebody uh, observed this the other night. It's not a thing of, yes, there's a, there's a concern, but it's not fear-driven, if you hear what I'm saying. It's not like, um, oh, Lord, it's game over, and it's like, oh, um, you know, a lost case. It's like there's an excitement, almost like an expectation that, listen, actually, this is the, 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 the breeding ground for God to birth something unique that the nations of the world has never seen before. I mean, we must be realized, uh, we must be honest and realize that, you know, there's a reason why South Africa is so diverse in, uh, in terms of our dem dem democ demography, demographics. Um, our, 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 the, uh, we have the nations represented in South Africa. Can you believe it? And God is showing that that's a microcosm of the macro calling that God has called us so that we can disciple nations. Amen? That's what Jesus meant in Matthew 28. And we, we all agree, yes, people must come to salvation. We must come to know the Lord Jesus. But out of that, people must be discipled to be the salt and the light. And this is very often where um, uh, the body of Christ have lost focus, that our focus is so towards the, what happens inside the walls that we don't know how to be salt and light and effective um, nation builders um, outside the walls. And the need, the crisis of the, the moment is like setting us up for the perfect transition. What happens outside these walls? It's not enough to say the church is fine. It's not enough. Or, you know, your local congregation is doing all right, so the rest of the world should also be fine. No, no, no. It's now saying, listen, if God is working here, we want to see him working outside these walls. And it's going to be, yes, the power of God, people coming to salvation, filled with the Holy Spirit, healings on the streets. Absolutely, we must see that. Revival breaking out. But we also will see a spirit and a heart for reformation, rebuilding, restoring, practical change. Um, that's exactly what, what, what James meant when he said, if my faith does not become action, my faith is dead. It's like a corpse, he compares it. And the, the time of, let's say, lukewarm Christianity, passive Christianity in South Africa is over. You're either going to be on fire for God and ready to do God's will, or you're going to be out of the game. You're not even going to be used by God. Because God's spirit is moving and he's raising up his people. So, so the, 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 the key thing to sense, to discern in this moment, is not what the enemy is doing. Amen? We are being shouted at by giants. The giants of corruption. The giants of poverty. The giants of mismanagement, of resources. All these giants are shouting at us. But David was more aware of God's plan for Israel, God's promises for Israel. That's why he said, who's this uncircumcised Philistine challenging the armies of God? Why? Because he called him uncircumcised. Why? Because the enemy has no agreement with God. There's no um, um, a covenant with the living God. They, as the nation of Israel, had a covenant. We are standing today in the new covenant cut by the blood of our Savior. And that shapes a reality that we are the carriers of God's promises for South Africa. Amen? Come on. We must realize this. This is the key thing. The body of Christ must realize we are the carriers of God's promises for this nation, for this continent. And it's up to the body of Christ to get organized, get functional, get effective, become salt and light, collaborate, and that's exactly what God is doing. You see, um, the Bible says, the, my people perish due to lack of vision and knowledge, understanding, understanding of what God has in mind. 
David could challenge Goliath because he had an understanding of what God had in mind for the nation. Amen. That's what gives him the, the, the authority to challenge uh, Goliath. That's why he immediately when Goliath s- challenged him and he said, who is this? Are you coming to me like, a, you know, with a stick and stones? Or am I a dog? Um, he said, I come to you in the name above all names. He immediately introduced himself as representative of God's assignment, God's promises. Amen? So we need to know what we represent. If we say, time to rise, what are we saying? It is saying we affirm that God is raising up his people. We affirm that God is saying, the word says, awake, O sleeper. Awake, O sleeper. We cannot be passive. Uh, Christianity is never meant to be passive. We've got religious structures and so many things in society that has put us in a box. And I believe God is now raising up the Joshua's, the Caleb's, the Esther's, the Deborah's, coming out of the caves, prepared by the Lord for a time such as this. And this is the beauty. And John and I and Mark and all the guys, Norton and traveling around the country, we're seeing this. God's people are stepping forward. And it's not going to be this position or that position or, you know, um, it's going to be function. Do you know the body of Christ is about functionality? Too much of the church's attention has been occupied by positions. The time for positions are over. We are all servants. We are servants of the Lord. There's only one head to the body. Come on. One head to the body. And that head is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are servants. We are following him. We are collaborating. So the model that I see taking shape, and God's given us the grace through time to rise, to put this network model in place across the nation, a net, a flat structure, not this pyramid structure. We're not lording over each other. We're saying, what can you do? What can I do? How can we collaborate? Let's move. And the word the Lord gave us for that was um, when we gathered at Camp Unity, end of January, um, uh, Ezekiel 37, the dry bones. The dry bones were scattered, lying around. And when Ezekiel prophesied, the Spirit of the Lord stirred it, and the dry bones became bone to his bone. Not just bones connecting, bone to his bone. Similar like the body of Christ. Similar bones in the same part of the body of Christ. Effective and linking up. Unity. Unity in spirit. And that unity God is stirring in the hearts of his people. A hunger for unity and a desire to be united with your brothers and sisters. And then eventually a standing army. And an army is different than a group of people standing. An army has focus. An army has a mandate. An army has order. An army are dangerous. They have weapons. Amen? You are dangerous. The one thing the enemy wants us is to be divided. Is to be disempowered. Do you know why the attack by the liberal agenda is such an onslaught? It is to rip us of the word of God, to water down the word of God. The Bible says this and this is not God's will. And the world says, no, 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 maybe the Bible doesn't say. Even church leaders and churches are saying, uh, you know, we heard the other day, where were we, John? We were at so many places. But the the, the guy, where was it? Um, I think in uh, PE, Port Elizabeth or, or, or East London. Uh, they was, yeah, East London. Um, they were saying the young guy going went to America. Almost at every um, American church, there's a rainbow color flag in front, saying we affirm, we agree. Our doors are open. Please, you're welcome. I mean, we want sinners to come in, but we want to convert them, lead them to Jesus, set them free. Amen. Not agree with them and allow them to come and now lead the church. Amen. God has a righteous standard. And if we water that down, the whole nation will collapse. So the church is called for a higher standard. And the Bible even says it. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raise up a standard against him and put him to flight. Amen. So what, what, the rising that's happening is God's standards that's being set for the nation. Because if we have a majority Christians in South Africa, 
this nation is supposed to be having biblical standards for government, for schools. The, the constitution needs to be aligned with the Bible. Amen? We're allowing the unrighteous to determine and set the rules of the game. And it's time for God's people to speak up, to stand up. Amen? Amen? That's why we are no longer available to do nothing. And it needs courage. Let me tell you, this world system is ready to impose itself fully. We've seen it through the medical uh, world. Um, even, I think, now in a couple of months' time, the World Health Organization, there's going to be a decision made about whether health regulations will superimpose itself upon governments. So when there's a crisis, a health crisis, governments have to stand back and they have to simply allow. That's a form of global government setting in right there. We are this close from a cashless society moving towards CBDC, central bank digital currencies. When you have a cashless society and you remove cash, the, the, then you can control the flow of money and you can set the tone. I'm an economist and I can tell you that's what the powers that be see as the solution. I've done my PhD in 2008, 2009 at the World Bank and the IMF in Washington. I was in, literally in the belly of the beast. I could see the plans they were setting up for the, for the whole world, um, where they centralize all forms of uh, financial controls um, and how the regulation are being put in place. Uh, the, even through the crisis, they, um, they used that even to get central banks and your uh, banking systems to submit to, the, to those kind of systems. Why? Because um, if you don't control the money system, uh, people have too much freedom. You know? so, so, and this is not to scare you. These are the realities right at the door. It's up to the church to decide, are we going to allow this? While we have a majority. You know, when I go lecture in Austria, um, in Salzburg, uh, there I'm astounded how you can sort out the problems, but the people are so far away from God. The children, the young people, don't even know the name Jesus. When you speak, it's like, uh, uh, who's that? You know, it's like, the, it's a lost generation. At least, yeah, though we've got problems, we have Jesus, and there's a sense among Christians. But the enemy has been so focused on taking the decision-making positions in the high, from the highest level to community level. And it's time for the body of Christ, like the army, to get organized, to link up with one another, to unite as a people. That's the vision. That's the, that, this is the only future for South Africa. Let me tell you, this is the only future for South Africa. Unless God's people stand up, this nation, it's game over. And it's not just about South Africa. Let me tell you, when we were in Sienekal, uh, one of the intercessors stood up and she said she could see in the spirit there's four giants surrounding Africa. Four giants. From the West, you've got liberal, secular humanism infiltrating. And we know all about the, the woke culture, all of that. From the East, you have socialism, a seemingly so successful uh, economic model by China. Uh, but that's op it's co communism, com oppression, fully using economic mechanisms. From the north, Muslim. In Europe, Muslims are outpopulating France, Germany, Austria, um, I, Scotland. Even as a Muslim president, um, the population growth in, in 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 Europe, many of the European countries, on average, is less than one child per family. The Muslims are having seven, eight children per family. You see, within 20 years, they outvote them, outpopulate them. They, a whole systemic change. And then what's the giant in the south? Witchcraft. Witchcraft. African witchcraft, Freemasonry. Um, you can include a lot of um, these um, because it's a form of manipulation and control. Um, how can people keep on voting when... They are being stolen from. They are bewitched. It's the only explanation. You know, that's why we need to deal with this specific stronghold. Just this week, I had a whole meeting with a team of, they are like snipers in the spirit. They are top, top intercessors. It's like your, your rekis. 
They understand the demonic altars. They've been there. They've been analyzing this for many years. They know exactly how this, how this um, we, we identifying the main arteries through South Africa because there's specific places where these strongholds are operating. And they are going to cut that down, uproot it, and they are going to target this. Because we need to break this, this stronghold. Because many of these political parties, they go and they provide sacrifices. And they actually, you know, draw from those powers. That's what's causing the mesmerization. You know, uh, just confusing our people. And why, you know, what keeps them in power. Only the body of Christ are equipped to deal with that. Nobody else. We have the anointing of God on our lives. We stand in the authority of Christ. We have the victory. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We are the ones called to deal with these powers. So, so it's time to get serious. It's time. We live in a time where unless there is a divine intervention, like a Gideon's army, in the night, go down and cut down those, those pillars, those ball pillars. Challenge the enemy, like Elijah, and say, come, bring your power. It's not coming from a place of arrogance. It's coming from a place of God is drawing a line. He's drawing a line. Enough of this. Enough of this. Enough of allowing the enemy to kill, steal, and destroy South Africa. No more. It's up to the body of Christ to, to physically draw that line in the sand. That's where we are getting to. That place. Remember, who's, who is the Lord going to use? He's going to use his body. You and me. It's going to be us. We just need to have the courage. That's why the Lord told Joshua, be strong and courageous. It's almost like I command you. You better be for the sake of your nation. That's where we are. You better be strong and courageous. You better not be intimidated by the giants that shout at you. You better be a David. That challenges them and speak God's word and release God's life over this nation. We cannot adopt the language of this world no more. This negativity, this just seeing the problems and all of this, uh, we cannot. You know, it's very interesting. There were two historic moments where God changed history from, uh, spectacularly. And both occasions he used language. The first one was at the Tower of Babel. History changed after the Tower of Babel. Why? He used language to confuse everybody, and the nations went uh, dispersed across the, 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 the earth. The second time, pouring out of the Holy Spirit. He used language to speak to all cultures, all nations. I believe God is using this new language, a language of hope, a language of life, a language of faith to change the situation in South Africa. There's so many good news stories in communities. John and I, when we travel, I mean, it's incredible. Even systems and things, practical things God, uh, people are putting in place, people of God. But we, you don't hear about this. You just hear the bad news. You don't, you know, these things are happening under the radar. So, what with time to rise, we are gathering those blueprints. We are connecting um, these initiatives to one another. We are getting people into their callings, into their, you know, um, what the Lord has prepared them for. Amen? Because the moment that starts happening, th then we become more effective. Um, so, so I want to give over to John, and then I'm going to come in again at the end. But I want you to hear there's a sound. The Lord is making. There's a sound. You know, when I hear that, when I hear that, I see the picture. There was this eagle who grew up among chickens, and he had a chicken mentality. And then they put him uh, in the cage on a hill one day, and they opened the cage, and the eagle was sitting there. And it was they were like, "Come on, it's time to fly," you know, and and he was just sitting there, and suddenly. Another eagle flew high over. And this eagle heard that sound, that cry of an eagle, and he shot up. He went. Amen? In one moment, his life changed. His destiny changed. There's a sound God is making, 
and it's bringing resonation. It, it resonates with some, with others it doesn't resonate. They don't hear it. They don't pick it up. The Bible differentiated between the wise virgins and the unwise virgins. The unwise virgins didn't have enough oil. But those who are filled with God's spirit, those who are ready to obey the king's command, amen, they will hear his voice. My sheep will know my voice, the shepherd's voice, amen. And the Lord is calling his people forward. So, uh, John, please come forward. And I would love us to just, um, um, I want to pray for him. And as he speaks, this is my brother. You must know. We are together. I love this man. I will take a bullet for this man. You must know. But we honestly feel this is also the picture of God bringing his people together in South Africa. Amen. Amen. He's healing this nation, stirring our hearts, bringing us together for a greater purpose. And uh, so let's just stretch out your hand to John as we pray for him. Father, we pray for John. Thank you, Lord, that yeah, you are raising up your leaders, Lord. You are bringing your men and women forward. And John is a man for a time such as this. Father, we pray that you use him, Lord, the words that he speak, that it be your words, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are birthing a new vision, your heart for this nation. And Father, we pray as he speaks, let us hear what you are saying, Lord. Not a man. We don't want to follow people. We want to follow Jesus. Let us be attentive to your voice. And we pray, Lord, use John, Lord, and speak through him in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together for Arno? Thank you so much, Arno. Wow. Yeah. What an exciting time that we're living in. Do you agree that we are living in the most exciting time in our nation? And this is not only for South Africa, but this is for Africa. There's something special that God is doing in this beautiful continent of ours. And it's such a privilege for me and Arno to really experience it because, you know, until you can see it in different places and different people, then you don't really get the idea of what God is doing. And we always say everywhere we go, it's almost like God has gone ahead of us. It's almost like God has prepared the hearts of people. It's, it feels like we, we're talking to the same people all the time. I mean, I'm standing here. I'm, it's like I'm talking to people in East London, people in Suwetu. Why? It's because there's the same spirit that resonates. There is a move of God in this nation, people. And that's why it's so important that the church must be rightly positioned. We need to be at the right position to be able to see what God is doing in the nation so that we can connect with that what God is doing. Because you see, the enemy has got a lot of shows on the, on the, on the roadside. But God has got the real show. And sometimes we can get distracted with what, what the enemy is doing. Because, I mean, that is his plan, is to distract us so that we don't see that the revival is upon us. Revival is upon us. Hallelujah. There is a move of God in this nation. I can tell you that. I mean, there's flames of revival burning everywhere. It, almost like every corner of this nation, something is burning. Those flames are coming up. And it's just a matter of time. There's going to be a big fire burning in this nation. This is not a wish. This is not a uh, man ideology. This is not a motivational speech. There's been people who prayed for many years and trusting God for revival to break out in, in, South, in South Africa. I mean, we've got a promise. So many prophetic words that went into this nation. Revival will start. From Cape to Cairo. Come on, somebody. You've got to be excited about this. And that's why we do what we do, because we believe that God is moving. When God moves, we move. We don't stay behind. Remember the journey of the children of Israel from Egypt, the pillar of cloud, during the day, the pillar of fire during the night. When it settled, the people settled. 
When it moves, they move. And that is so important. The Bible talks about the sons of Issachar. These were men that understood times, the Kairos moment of God in a nation. Not only understanding that and having a revelation of the Kairos moment, but also having a kingdom strategies, knowing what the people or the church are to do in that time. And that is for us a blessing that in this time we can not only pray, we can not only prophesy and hope, but God can actually give strategies and say, this is how you prepare for the revival. We're not, God, we're not bringing the revival. He's bringing the revival. Hallelujah. He's the one who's pouring out the spirit. He's the one who's lighting up the fire of revival. But what we do is to prepare ourselves and to prepare the nation for the move of God. We cannot afford to miss this one. Why do I say it's the most exciting time we're living in? Exactly as Arno said. Go in and look at your, um, uh, the journey and the story of Jesus. When he was performing miracles, he never performed a miracle if there was no need. I mean, in other towns, they ask him, can you perform a miracle for us? He said, no. So what happens when, 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 when everything falls apart? When there is a brokenness in a nation, when it seems like there is a blanket of darkness over a nation, when people are going into despair and there is hopelessness everywhere, what happens to the church? What is the role of the church? Where is the church at that time? That is the perfect time for the church to be revealed. Hallelujah. Amen. In Romans 8 verse 19, it talks about the whole creation is waiting in eager expectation, great anticipation. For what? For the next uh, leader, political leader to emerge? For the next uh, Einstein to give us a plan how to deal with this? No. What does the Bible say, people? It's waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. Hallelujah. Amen. The manifestations of the sons of God. And if that son is the church, is the remnant. It talks about me and you. That in the darkest hours of a nation, that's when the church emerges. Because the Bible says we are called to be salt and light. Amen. So when do, when do our, 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 our light become brighter? In the dark. Hallelujah. That's when our light becomes brighter. I mean, somebody asked me and said, but why do you care about politics? Why do you care about, you know, government? This is an ugly story, man. Don't get yourself in this stuff. This is dark. This is like a hole. It's a dark hole. And I mean, somebody who was asking me is a child of God, and I said to him, my brother, how bright is your light? If that is so dark, how bright is your light? Did Jesus say, only be the light where it's comfortable? <laughs> where you feel safe? Where you don't have so much to lose? He says, go. I sent you, be the light and the salt in the nation. And I believe we're living in an hour where God is raising up his people. And when we talk about the people of God, we don't talk about color. We talk about people who are knitted together with the love and the spirit of God. And if there is any, 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 any movement, if there's any institution that's going to break the walls of separation, it is the church. Exactly what Arno have just done here. This is the heart of God. That when I see him, I see my brother. We are one. We are one in the spirit. We are washed with the same blood. Hallelujah. 
And you know, um, the Lord challenged me a couple of years back about the reversing the curse of Cain in the nations. Reversing the curse of Cain in the nation. What is the curse of, the, of Cain? When the Lord came to him and said, where is thy brother? He gave an answer that continued to haunt nations, even our nation, South Africa. And that answer was, am I my brother's keeper? And I mean, you can see what happened with generations and generations between people, between brothers, not wanting to take a responsibility of one another. This is my brother. I will take a bullet for him. Amen. Meaning that I will cover him. I will not discover him. I, will not, I mean, I will not uncover him. I will cover him. Because there is a destiny that connects us. And I believe that the Lord is raising a remnant in, in our time. Men and women that will be able to answer that question and say, Yes, I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. You know how many, um, how many years and how many, how much money people have made just separating people, just on, just divide them. It has actually become a very lucrative exercise for el for the enemy. Keep them separated, divide them. You know, put politics in between bring all this nonsense and let them stay uh, divided. And as they stay divided, you keep control. And even in the church, the enemy has managed to do that. But those days are over. Hallelujah. The Lord is bringing the body together. The church is answering the most important question. I am my brother's keeper. And that is the unity. Because I can tell you, we can see the move of God passing before us if we don't go over that wall of division. If we don't step into the identity that God has given us as a nation, there is a plan, there is a reason why we are, we are diverse in this nation. There's not a single person who is even in this room and you are here by a mistake. Whether a Zulu, whether a Sutu, whether an Indian, Africans, English, everybody in this place, God had a plan for you to be here. We are planted in this nation. Hallelujah. And we need to begin to listen to the right sound. Arno, the right sound. There is a right sound that heaven is blowing over this nation. It's the sound of, of revival and reformation. But there is also the wrong sound. It is the sound of revolution that emanates from the spirit of rebelliousness which originates in heaven when the enemy, the devil, revolt against God. Come on. Those are two different things. And sometimes it really, it pains my heart to see that you can have a church that trusts God for revival and transformation, but yet they give their ear to the sound of revolution. Because those two don't go together. Revolution, it is not God's idea to bring change in nations and society. It has never been God's idea. You don't find even that word in the Bible. The only time you find that word, you find it in the negative, not in the positive. You know, history also tells us that... Um, this word uh, or the revolution actually started with long time ago in the in the in the in the in the hundreds with with America or Germany I mean uh, France and Britain but it actually started in heaven 
with Lucifer revolting against God. And that seed of revolution was planted in the, in the Garden of Eden when he deceived Adam and Eve also to rebel against God. And so the seed went through generations. But reformation is birthed out of revival. And that's why it's so important even when we talk about how God is going to change South Africa. We cannot start with reformation before revival. <laughs> because you need a change of hearts. That's why the preaching of the gospel becomes very imperative. That we need to speak Jesus to the nation. Amen? We need to speak Jesus, preach Jesus to the nation. Because the hearts of people must change. A revived heart will reform the nation. I mean, if you study also the, 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 the reformation, how it started, the revival, every reformation came out of a revived heart. Amen? All these great men who reformed even systems, they were people that were visited by God. They had an encounter with God. And this is, the, this is the time that the nation must have an encounter with God. Because it is only people who had an encounter with God that will be able to steward the nation. That will steward. This, this nation is a gift. South Africa is a gift. It is, it is a special nation. I mean, God has given us an opportunity. We also travel in some of the parts of of, of the continent, and you get to understand when you get into those nations, then you realize, oh my goodness, I am so blessed to actually be in South Africa. You start to realize that you are blessed. But a lot of people don't realize that. And that's why people will even, you know, follow the wrong sound that they don't even have an idea where this sound is going to end. Because there is an agenda to keep the continent poor and broke by the enemy. He doesn't want Africa to rise his head. But listen, the king of kings is coming through. There is a wind of change that is blowing over this continent. Africa will rise his head. Hallelujah. And Africa is me and you. But it starts here. So it's time to rise. But why do we need to rise? Why do we rise? We rise because we don't only have to give hope. We have to be that hope. We have to be that hope. And that's the thing about being a child of God. You don't just talk about hope. You don't just preach about hope, but you actually become that hope. Because that hope lives inside of you. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So if I have Christ in me and I show up in a community where there is brokenness, I don't just pray and say, God, oh God, just give them hope. I step in and I say, God, how can I save? Show me how to serve, how to make a difference. Because at that time, I've got a wall in, before me and I have to build the wall in front of me, like in the, in the days of Nehemiah. I may not build the whole wall, but there is a wall that is in front of me that God said, I'm trusting you, just build here. And if every one of us can build in front of them, and when you look, you lift your head and you look, that hall, the whole wall will be built up. And that's how we become change in this nation. And that's what Time to Rise is about. We've, we've, we've prayed, we've hoped, and we have received prophetic words. But the time has come where the Lord is saying, you need now to take action. And this is how you must take action. God is giving the plan. Organize my people. Let my people come together. When they come together, let them be organized. 
Let them have a plan. Let them have a vision. And the next thing we're going to meet now, I don't know, we'll talk a little bit about the event in October. But that is just to taste the unity of the remnant. What it feels to be together and to be connected together. But the work doesn't end there because we are, we are not called for events. But events are there to kick something in our spirit. After that, we say, how are we going to rebuild our nation? So Time to Rise is not only about 2024, and a lot of people want to make it about politics and 2024. It's not. We are not a political party. We will, not, will never be a political party. But we trust in God for a righteous government in this nation. We've got every reason to trust God for that. We've got every reason to trust God for that, and we're not going to apologize. We're not even going to over-explain ourselves. It's just the truth. We cannot afford to compromise any longer. We need to trust God for a righteous government, whatever that means. We need to trust God and say, God, we want women and men and women that will sit there and bring the fear of the Lord back in this nation. Otherwise, the entire generations, not generation, generations are going to be lost. So that's where we are standing as time to rise. And we say, God, if you raise those men and they raise their hands, we're going to put our weights behind them. And we will support anything that says Jesus must be the foundation of this nation. Hallelujah. So I'm so excited in my heart because I know at this time, in a time such as this, that's when the church becomes alive. So I'm not going to walk in the street hopeless, but I'm going to walk with an excitement because I know creation has been waiting for somebody like me. So I don't know. Thank you so much, my friend. Yes, yes, Mark. God bless you. Okay, well, that's been amazing so far. Thank you, John. And that's exactly what we're all about here. So we're going to take a short break. So you can take about, a, I think, a 10-minute break. And then we're going to come back for the conclusion of this session here tonight. Okay? So just 10 minutes. Take your stand-up.